Happy Mother's Day, TC. Let's get it for all the moms in the room real quick. Can we just do that? Man, you guys are awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So uh, one of the games I remember playing a, a, a lot when we were growing up, my mom was quite the, she would get into trouble with us growing up. I remember we were TPing somebody's house one time, uh, and she drove the getaway van uh, and then almost left my brother at the crime scene. And so um, that was a good time. We used to play hide and seek growing up and, uh, you know, hide and seek, you're trying to find the best spot. But we also played this game, sardines. Does anybody know about sardines? All right. So essentially think of sardines, but then let a bunch of very irresponsible, think of hide and seek, but let a bunch of irresponsible people get involved. And that's essentially what happens. So you turn all the lights off to where it's completely dark, right? You can't see your hand in front of your face. And then you hide. One person is it. Everyone goes and hides. But as you find everyone that's hiding, you just hide with them. Right? So, pause, rewind. One person hides. Everyone's looking for them. And as you find them, you all just hide with them. And then the last person to find this mob of people that's trying to fit on top of the refrigerator, uh, they get to hide next time. It's a great time. All right? So, I remember playing hide and seek and doing all that stuff. And one time I was hiding from my mom. I, I, don't, I can't remember if I was hiding from her or it just happened to, like, disappear. But... I was at J.C. Penney's, and my mom was shopping. And if y'all remember the circular clothing racks, we used to be about the right size. We could fit inside of those, right? And so she was taking God's forever looking at whatever. And so I just rolled up in there, and I was like, I'm going to hide from her. And then she's going to be like, oh, I can't find him. I'm going to pop out and scare, and it's going to be great. But then I fell asleep in there. <laughs> and so she was like, I, I'm assuming she was freaking out. I don't know. I wasn't there. I was unconscious. So uh, I was, I wake up and it's like, you know, how you wake up and you're like, man, am I in a different world right now? Like I come out from the clothing rack and I expect it to be like 2086, like year 20. Like, it was just like, I come out, my mom's not there. I'm surrounded by a bunch of people. I don't know. I'm like eight years old. You know what I mean? Like I'm freaking out. And so I'm like, where's my mom? So uh, she had always told me like two things. Don't talk to strangers, but if you get lost, go talk to a stranger. Um, and so I went to the counter and was like going to have him page her by the time she comes walking around the corner. I see her. She sees me. It's this beautiful moment. I run into her arms. I was like, don't ever do that to me again. She's like, don't ever do that to me again. And so I can't imagine like how moms feel sometimes because I know it's got to be stressful, right? Moms, this is your moment. All right. So it's got to be stressful, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a mother is so many things to her family, and it can be hard to know where to turn and when you need something. And I kind of wanted to look at a few things because a lot of times what we do is we try to, moms, put into you this confidence and this hope of, of who you are and, and how great you are. And listen to me, you are all of those things. But how many guys know there are some weeks and some days where you don't feel that? If we're, if we're all honest in here for a second, moms, there are some days, some weeks, some months where you just feel like you're barely keeping it all together. Am I right? And what I want to start today by showing you is when you don't feel like you're enough, you get to go to the one who is enough. And I want to show you a few things today. And so if you'll get out your notes, we'll, we'll go there today. And we're just going to kind of move through a few things as I was praying about not just moms, but truth be told, this is all of us. But we're going to talk to some moms today. Because how many guys know, uh, gentlemen, ladies, all of us, when we're trying our best and we don't feel like we're getting there, we need Jesus to show up. And so I want to just go through a few things that I feel like uh, will help. The first thing I want you to know is that he's your peace when you feel like you've been waging war. Any moms feel like you've waged war over your children before? Anybody? Any moms, any moms prayed your kids through some craziness, right? Uh, I was terrified of my dad's belt growing up. But then I turned like 14 and I was taller than him and bigger than him. And so uh, not to say I wasn't still terrified of his belt, but nonetheless, like, I remember growing up. And then what I realized once I hit about 16 is I need to be a lot less concerned with my dad's belt. And I need to be more concerned with my mom's prayers. Like, <laughs> because... My mom could pray the mess out of something. And I remember growing up and, and being in relationships. And if my mom had decided that her and God were going to get together in a coup against my relationship, guess what was happening? That bad boy was gone. 
Now, it might have taken 18 months for me to figure it out, but it was already, like, she had set it in motion. And so, listen, I want you to understand something. She could, my mom could go to war in the spirit. Oh, like, I remember when me and my sister, we were, our, our spiritual life wasn't lining up. And more than I was worried about my dad sitting down and having a stern talk with me, if I knew my mom came out of her room and she had just got done praying and she was crying, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> the Lord's coming after me. <laughs> you know, like, because my mom will move heaven and earth. And what I love about my wife is she's the same way. And there's something to that. See, I want to encourage you for a second, mom, uh, moms, because I want to encourage you to operate in your strengths for your family rather than feeling like you're operating in the shadow of your failures. Because you're always going to feel like you're not enough. And there's this war that's going to constantly wage inside of you of inadequacy and inferiority and a lack of whatever it is that you feel like you need to be the best version of yourself. And listen to me, operate in the strengths that God has given you rather than operating in the shadows of the failures you feel like you're not good enough. And when we come to Jesus, he's our peace when we feel like we're waging war. And guess what? It's not just for moms. That's for all. As a matter of fact, everything we're going to show you. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say again, rejoice. So let's say that word rejoice. So Paul comes out of the gate. He's like, rejoice in the Lord always. But anybody ever thought you were going to rejoice in the Lord? And by the time you got to the place where you wanted to rejoice, things had already gone completely wrong and sideways. I think that's why he says it again, right? Rejoice in the Lord. Man, sometimes, hey, I said it again, rejoice, right? So he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Moms, don't be anxious about anything. You're like, have you seen the dishes piling up in my sink right now? Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, and this is what I want you to see, in every situation, not by freaking out and yelling, not by losing your temper, even though I get it, you're going to do some of those things. But Paul has given a word to the Philippians that I think we can hear from right now. Not because you're going to do your best as a mom, not because you're going to say all the right things, not because you're going to show up at all the right events or be on time for this or be able to put them in this event or that event. Listen to me. The best thing you can do is put your children and their names before God every day. It says, with prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you still got to, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, give them that look. Say it again. Just say it again. Right? And this is what it says for you guys. And the peace of God, say peace of God, which transcends all understanding. In other words, the peace of God that doesn't even make sense to have. It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So he's your peace when you're waging war, but he's also your strength when you feel like you've, got, you've given away all of your strength. He's your strength when you feel like you've given all of your strength away. Anybody ever felt like you just had nothing left before? Have you ever felt like, man, I, I don't even know if I can keep going like this? Cool, seven of us. The rest of y'all just got it, huh? Millionaires in the house? No, like, like he's, he's your strength when you've given it all away. When you feel like the best of you has been given to diaper changes and dishwashing and strength. Wait, no, you can't do that. Uh, and, and chasing after kids. When you feel like the best of you has been putting the toys back in the toy box only to walk around the corner to hear again, right? When you feel like the best of you has been given to the laundry and the best of you has been to cooking the meals that they just decided today they don't eat anymore, but yesterday they surely did. When you feel like the best of you has been given away to everything in your family, when you feel like you've run out, listen to me, when the best of you has been given to your school programs and their sporting events and it's been given to cooking and cleaning and all of those things, when you feel like you've given the best of you away to all of that, listen to me, there's still a strength that isn't up to you to have. It's just up to you to lean into. It's not your strength, but it's a strength you can have. And this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 12. It says this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in you giving it your best. Is that what it says? For my power is made perfect in 
you really doing it all, and I'll just kind of come in and sprinkle some good stuff. on. Is that what it says? My power is made perfect whenever you're killing it as a mom. Is that what it says? My strength is made perfect, listen to me, in your weakness. Jesus is most glorified in us, not when we're doing our best, but when through the power of his spirit, we're somehow able to do our best, even when we're at our worst. And so I'm here to tell you today to find great courage in the fact that he's our strength, right? But then he says, right, and he goes on to say, therefore, I'll boast all the more. Paul says, I'll boast about my weaknesses so that Christ's power can rest on me. So he's our peace. He's our strength. He's also your hope when you feel like situations are hopeless. Turn to your neighbor and say hope. Come on, turn to your and say hope. Just a little louder. He's your hope when situations seem hopeless. Like, I want you to think about this for a second. When you feel like there's no way things can get better, there's no way this kid is ever going to be in his right mind ever again. There's no, I don't like, there's no way he's going to ever be above a D student, which, you know, shout out to C students in the house for just a second. All right. So like, you know what I'm saying? Where are the A students at? Where y'all at? A students, where y'all at? The curve killers. <laughs> Take a day off every once in a while. How about that? You know what I'm saying? Skip a day. You know, you could, you could, you could miss a day. You'll be fine, actually. So, we only made fun of you because you were too smart. Anyways, all right, so, but, man, if, if, whatever you're going through, maybe your kid's still trying to figure some stuff out, you're trying to figure some stuff out, family's trying to figure some stuff out, school, like, whatever it is. Listen, the reality is this, when situations seem hopeless, you don't need to just get stronger, and you don't just need to hang on, you need to hang on to something that can get you through the rough patches, And it's not a something, it's a someone. You need to hang on to the someone that can get you through those rough patches. You need hope when things seem hopeless. Romans 15, 13 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Any moms or or just people in here ever needed hope or peace before? You ever been in some situations where you were hopeless and peaceless and you needed both of those things to show up? Come on, I know some of y'all have not had any problems in your life, but is there two or three people that's gone through some stuff in here? All right, so it's like, I need hope and I need peace because everything around me seems ridiculously chaotic and I don't know if we're going to get through this. And I'm here to tell you today, may the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace and faith so that you overflow with hope. Hope, a belief that this isn't where it ends. Come on. A belief that we're going to make it through this. Like, man, filled with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's our hope. Then he's also your place of rest. Say rest. He's your place of rest when you feel restless. He's the place of rest when you feel restless. I'll never get enough sleep. Come on, moms. If If I've talked about one thing, right, this is it right here. Somehow your kids manage to like, make so much noise all the time unless you're trying to sleep and they manage to get right here but they don't say nothing they just let you wake up and find them nose to nose with you like you know what I'm saying like so I'm not advocating I'm just anyway so but man he's our place of rest you you, sometimes we feel like we never get enough sleep my wife she loves sleep it's a hobby on her list Like most people, they, they need eight hours a day of sleep so that they can work for 16. My wife needs 16 hours of sleep so she can work for eight, okay? So like, she loves, like, I, I'm like, maybe we should, I'm, I tell her all the time she's narcoleptic. She's like, um, isn't that it, narcoleptic? Yeah, so I tell her all the time she's not, I was like, I really was like, maybe that's not right. I tell her all the time, I'm like, you have narcolepsy. She's like, narcolepsy is when you can fall asleep anywhere. And I'm like. She's like, no, I mean, like, at any time, I could just fall asleep. I'm like, you're not building up a good argument for yourself right now. Like, um, but here's the thing that I think is important when we talk about rest. Because I don't believe that just sleep is what we're talking about here. 
There's a rest that goes, back, goes past your physical body and it gets to your soul. There's a rest that's not just that I'm tired and I need to take a nap. There's a rest that my soul is tired. Maybe you've ever felt this way. I don't know if I can keep going like this. That's a tired soul. And that's the beauty behind Matthew 11, 28 through 29. That Jesus is talking. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. He says, I'll give you rest. For those of you that have been carrying around a burden that, quite frankly, you were never supposed to carry. For all of you that are trying to be a superhero to your kids or to your husband or, or even men in the house that maybe you're carrying a load as a mother and a father. Or, or maybe you've, you're, you're trying to do your best. Here, listen to me. Some of you are trying to be something God never asked you to be. Some of you are trying to just be God. And hear me. That's a weight you can't carry. You can't be God, but hear me, this is the beautiful part. You can come to him. And in all the seasons where you know you're not enough, listen, go to the one who is enough. Go get rest. And it keeps on going. It says, take my, Jesus is talking, to take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find what? You will find the kind of rest you really need. Rest for your souls. Listen to me, I want to give all of you permission for this, especially, especially moms, because it's, it's kind of your day, but I want to give all of you permission to this. Take a deep breath and just breathe it out. How good did that feel? Like, rest for your souls. And then, last but not least, I wanted to take a moment and just talk to moms who may be mourning today. Or maybe just people. Maybe you're mourning today. Listen to me. He is all the things we listed, but he's also your comfort when you're uncertain about the next season. He is your comfort when you are uncertain about what the future holds. I don't know if we're going to do this. I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. I don't know if this is going to, I don't listen to you. He's your comfort when you don't know. For those of you who've been trying to be a mom, you want to be a mom and you're uncertain as to what cards God has in store for you. Listen to me. He's your comfort when you're uncertain about the next season. When you don't know if you're going to get to go back to school, you're unsure about what your career field looks like in the future. You don't know if you can do this. Listen, he's your comfort. He's everything that you need. He'll carry you through some of these very difficult seasons in your life. He's, he's there for you. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your understanding. Because how many knows when we lean on our understanding, that's when we get into it. Anybody ever leaned on your understanding when you were dating before? Right? In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. So when your paths of life seem uncertain, when it seems like it's winding through the most difficult valleys you could possibly imagine, lean on him because he's the one that has the ability to straighten the paths that seem to make you cross-eyed. He has that ability. So it's important for us to understand who Jesus is for you, because if you don't, you're tempted to identify by your shortcomings and by your faults. And listen to me, we all have shortcomings, we all have faults, we all have failures, and we're all going to miss it. Moms, you're going to miss it. You're, there's going to be days where you don't get it right. There's going to be days where you lose your temper. Maybe not. No, maybe so. Okay, there's going to be days where, like, there's going to be days where you don't get it right. But that's the important part. Listen, it's not about identifying with what we're not. It's all about identifying with what Jesus is. You're not enough. And listen to me. I know the world has tried to ask you to be enough, but I'm here to tell you right now, I'm giving you permission, if you need it, to identify with this one true fact. You're not enough, and you're not supposed to be. Because if you were your kid's savior, you would never point them to the real one. If you were God, you would never point them to him. Listen to me. They don't need a perfect mother. They need to see a mother that's leaning on Jesus. They don't need a perfect father or mother. They need to see, listen, our kids need to see us loving God so much that it's addictive for them. And so what do we do? We have to understand, listen, and, and this is the part that's crazy to me about the Bible. Uh, I think it's like in a translation thing. Ever notice how everything in the Bible is associated with the worst version of people? For example, let me give you an example. Uh, anybody ever heard of uh, like the woman caught in adultery? Anybody? Yeah, we've all heard that story for you, the woman caught in adultery. We don't call her the woman that Jesus gave grace to. We identify her with the worst version of herself, right? Rahab the prostitute. 
We don't call her like Rahab the secret agent. Like she was 007 before it was 007. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't identify her with who she became. We identify her with who she was, right? The woman with the issue of blood. We don't identify her as the, the woman that Jesus healed. We identify her with the things she couldn't get rid of. And this is something that I feel like maybe have, has eked its way into our brains a little bit, is how we continue to identify us and the people around us, not with what God is doing in our life, but with where we came from in our life. We're still too connected to the old version of us to realize who the new version of us should be. And so my encouragement to you today, and that's what I kind of want to look at for just a second, because in Mark 5, there's a story of the woman with the issue of blood. Now, we've preached about this, and many of you have probably heard this before, but I want to give you some encouragement, especially moms today, but just everybody, to recognize what's happening. And so uh, let's pick up at verses 25 and 26. And a woman was there in the city that Jesus is walking through. All right, just for the record, to catch some of you up, Jesus is walking through the city. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, not to be crude or anything like that, but she had been on her cycle for 12 straight years, all right? And so she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Now, I want to point out some key words here because she was subject to bleeding for 12 years. She suffered under a great deal, right? She spent all she had. They spent, and she only got worse. She never got better. It's a, to catch you on what's happening. And so she hears that Jesus is coming. And as she hears that Jesus is, is coming, she's like, finally, I have hope. Because we talked about hope a second ago. She's like, I've got hope. I've got to get to him. And so this is where she's at. She's like, if I could just get to Jesus, I can be right where I'm at. And so what does she do? She, she goes in, and listen, she was out of strength. But in her weakness, she found a way to Jesus. She was out of money, but in her poverty, she still found a way to get to Jesus. She was out of information, right? But in her hopelessness, she still found a way to get to Jesus. She was out of energy, but in her desperation, she still found a way to get to Jesus. And listen to me if you're, if you're out there, and maybe you're going through some stuff right now. Maybe you're a mom and you feel like you're at wit's end. Maybe you're, you're a dad and you feel like you're at your wit's end. Maybe you're just a person and you feel like you're wit's end. Listen to me. She was out of everything that made sense, and yet she still had something in her that was going to go where she needed to be. Even though she was out of information, she was out of money, she was out of strength, she was out of hope. Even when you're out of those things, there's still somebody that has those things. And she presses in, and maybe you feel like you've run out of things sometimes, but in your moments of emptiness, you can go to her. Matthew 9, 20 through 21 is the, the tail end of the same story. And she came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Say him. She touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I could just touch his garment, I'll be whole. She was saying, I don't even need him to reach out and put his hand on my head. I don't even need him to like, will poof me with a Bible. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even need like the whole cruise of oil. You know what I'm saying? I don't need to catch a super soaker of anointing. Okay. Like I do not need a giant water balloon of Holy Spirit right now. I just need to touch him. I just, she said, I don't need all of him, but I'm at a point right now where I do need some of him. Anybody? You ever been in a spot where you go, I don't need all of Jesus right now. I'll take all of them. But God, I just need, I just need something. And so she, she's looking at him and she came up behind him, touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I could be whole. Listen to me, moms, I want to give you this word today. Your family doesn't need an empty version of you doing your best. They just need a version of you that's connected to God. I'm say it again. Your family doesn't need an empty version of you doing your best. They just need any version of you that's connected to God. And I remember I was telling you, I, I grew up playing hide and seek, right? What's the main, what, what do you brag about the most when you're playing hide and seek? The best spot. You know how when you get done, 
Well, first of all, if you found the, what's the real test on whether or not you found the best spot in hide and seek? The game ends and you're still hiding. Everybody else is eating pizza and Cheetos, right? And you're still behind that cabinet water heater that nobody knows about, right? You done grown a mustache, you know, like. And I think for some of us, for some of us, I think this is what we think Jesus is doing to us. We feel like we're playing a game of hide and seek with the King of Kings. And so what we think is like, hey, Jesus is hiding and we're just try- like, I'm trying to do my best to find him. And I, he is just like, he must be behind the water heater because I cannot find this guy anywhere. And so what, what I think time and chaos and pain and trauma and hurts and difficulties has done to us is it's put us in this framework where we see Jesus as the one that's hiding from us. And we're going, I just need you. And we're going, if you would just show yourself. And guess what happens? Then when that happens, we start getting bitter because we feel like Jesus doesn't want to come find us. And we feel like when we're looking for him, we can't find him. And so we find ourselves in these difficult places of going, God, I just need to find you. And here's what happens. Let's be honest for a second. We start getting mad at God because we feel like we can't find him. But Jesus isn't hiding from you behind the water heater. How many guys have ever played hide and seek with a two-year-old? Anybody? Anybody? You, you find the most ridiculous places to hide, right? Like, like you're 300 pounds hiding behind a basketball goal. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no way he's going to find me. Here. Like, you're hiding from him like he's two years old. Listen, this is what Jesus is doing with us. Listen, he's not hiding from you. Like, in the most concealed spaces, listen to me, he's hiding from you in the most ridiculous spaces. He's not trying to get away from you. He's doing everything he can to make sure you see him, just like the two-year-old. He's hiding behind the table, got his legs sticking out. Like, come on, dog, look over here real quick. I know you can see, like, you know, like, just come, hey. No, I'm not right. Like, he's hiding behind the couch, but he's got an arm and a leg flopped over too. Like he, listen, Jesus is putting himself in places for you where you don't have to look hard to find him, but you do have to look to find him. You don't have to go through chaos. You're not going to stay up all night trying to find Jesus. Listen, he's right there all the time. He is your hope. He is your peace. He is your joy. He is your strength. But listen, you do have to go to him because if you think Jesus is just going to whoop you, That's not going to happen. The woman with the issue of blood needed just a touch from Jesus. But listen, she had to get out of her house. And so many of us are just sitting up in our bedroom going, you know, Jesus, if you really wanted to show up, you would. And Jesus is going, if you really needed me, so would you. Jesus is saying, why don't you stop playing God? Why don't you come down here? Because listen, my yoke is easy. And my burden's light. And I want you to come looking for me. And just like with us, Jesus isn't hiding well. And so we'll say this as we wrap up. She reaches out and she touched the hem of his garment. I was in Israel a few years back. And the guide that was walking us through this particular area referenced this story. And he was telling us, that in Jewish culture, the prayer shawls, you guys have seen the prayer shawls, so like the kind of looks like a towel with tassels hanging off all around it. It was common for a Jewish person to have that. And, and on the corners, there was holes punched in it and long tassels that came off the corners. So it had little tassels all the way around it, but it had long tassels that came off the corners. And so, um, and what they would do when they would pray is they would, they would literally take that, pull it over their head, and they would grab the corners and they would cross it in front of them. And, that's, and then if you've ever seen people kind of rock and pray and they kind of have that thing going on, that's what they're doing. And this is what they believe. Listen, they believe that those corners are a divine connection to God for their prayer life. And so they'll go, they grab their connection to God, they cross it across their chest, and that's what they do when they pray. And so they sit there and, and they'll pray. And when they're done, they'll, guess what they call those corners? the hem of the garment. You want to know what this woman did? She didn't know she did it. You know know what she did? She didn't just touch Jesus. She touched Jesus' divine connection to God. Now, Jesus is all those things in and of himself. 
But when she reached out, she touched something more than just the man, more than just the God in the flesh. She also touched a representation of his connection to the Father. And listen to me today. The temptation, mom, is to say, I need to be like Jesus for my kids. And I'm here to tell you, mama, you're no Jesus. You're no savior. That is not who you are. You're not a savior to your family. You're not a savior to your kids. But listen to me, on the days when they aren't looking at God, on the days where they're not even looking for righteousness and on the days where you don't feel like you've got it figured out and you don't feel like you've got it all together, listen to me. When you're trying your best, listen, listen, I want you to lean in for this last moment, listen to me. On the days when you're trying to do everything you can do as a mother or just as a person or as a man, when you're doing everything that you can do, listen to me, listen, you're never a savior to the people around you, but what the people around you need is for you to be connected to the savior. When they reach out and touch you. They don't need to find God when they touch you. They just need to find someone that's connected to God when they touch you. They need to find connection to God who can give everything that you need. And so listen, I want to encourage you today. Listen, if you've been disconnected, if you've been hurting, if you've been trying to figure some things out, I'm going to tell you today that Jesus is the one that can get you everything that you need. He is your hope. He is your strength. He is your peace. And lean into that today because when you're not enough, and hear me, we're not enough. Jesus is enough. And so let's not be Savior. Let's connect our families to the Savior. Amen? Let's pray today. Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are, God. What I pray right now, that we would see you, Jesus, for who you are. You are our hope. You are our strength. You are our peace. You are our comfort, God. And so we come to you looking for you to be everything that we need. Thank you, God, that we can trust you. Thank you, God, that we can put our hope in you. And so, God, I pray for every one of them, Father, that as we look to you, that we wouldn't find strength in and of ourselves, but we would find a connection to you that is the strength we need. We wouldn't find hope in and of our own power, God, that we would find a connection to you, and that is our power. And so, God, I pray right now for moms all across this auditorium who are tired of trying to be everything, that you would give them a grace to realize it is not up to them to be everything, and that you carry us. And so, Father, we look to you, we thank you, and we love you this morning. In Jesus' name, if you're here today and you just, quite frankly, want to make this simple, you need Jesus to forgive you of what's in your life now and move forward with God so that your past no longer dictates your future. When Jesus went to the cross and he died there, he paid for your sins. And today, if you want those sins to be forgiven, you want a clean slate in Jesus, the Bible says, that we put our faith and we repent, we turn from that life, but we put our faith in Jesus, that we believe that when he died on the cross, he died for our sins. And if that's you today, you're ready to say yes to Jesus, we wanna invite you to pray this prayer with us. And this prayer doesn't make you saved. This prayer puts words to the actions of your heart, says, Jesus, I'm believing in you that you paid for my sins and I'm giving you my life. And if that's you, I wanna invite you to pray this prayer with me and the whole church will pray with you. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me my sins. Forgive me my wrongs. Make me pure and make me whole. I believe you died for me, so I give you my life. Make me brand new. Give me a fresh start, and I'll follow you forever. In Jesus' name, come on, TC, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome.